Whenever I am asked to talk about the topic of stress, I often really reflect on how it's important that we think about um, how this is dealt with from a prophetic lens. We look at the seerah of the Prophet وسلم, and see how he, in his mashallah, as the human who was able to have the most perfect form of emotional intelligence, how the Prophet وسلم, dealt with every form of emotion in his lifetime. And stress was definitely not something um, unknown to the Prophet وسلم, and unknown to his Sahaba and his companions whom we learn quite a bit from. And so the story that I'd like to start to share here is one that I've shared often um, and that I really enjoy from the Hadith literature. And it's a young companion of the Prophet وسلم, young when this story takes place, he was a young boy. And his uh, nickname was Aba Umair. And Aba Umair was uh, you know, a young uh, boy who was very close to the Prophet وسلم, him and his entire family. The Prophet وسلم, would often go to their home and uh, visit and was well acquainted with the parents and the other sibling. And Abu Talha, the father, and Um Sulaim, the mother of this young boy, um, were uh, very close to the Prophet وسلم, as was his brother, who was probably more famous than this particular companion, Abu Umayr. And he was none other than Anas ibn Manik. And because of this closeness to the family, the Prophet وسلم, was well acquainted with the, the emotions and also um, you know, the, the everyday happenings of this particular family. And on one day, one occasion, the Prophet وسلم, entered into their home to visit them. And he found Abu Umayr isolated, kind of a, you know, taking, taking a corner and was um, tearful. And I remind us how the Prophet وسلم, is always somebody who is very, very busy and has much, much uh, to do. And the, the affairs of the ummah weigh on his shoulders, his blessed shoulders, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yet he acknowledged and made, uh, it was clear to him that there was something happening even with a young boy. It would have been very easy to dismiss this incident or to, you know, to say to oneself, I have a lot to do. I don't have time for this, right? But the Prophet ﷺ made note of this and wanted to sort out what was happening, but also didn't want to go directly to the young boy and ask him so that he does not trouble him further. And here as we learn so many different lessons in emotional intelligence of the Prophet ﷺ. The first thing the Prophet ﷺ did is he asked the family members, he asked the others, what's happening with Abu Hamid? What is happening here with him? So that he understands the backstory before trying to give any advice, especially in a way that, of course, any advice coming from the Prophet ﷺ would be fully welcomed. But think about us. Think about us who are not divinely inspired. We often will give unsolicited advice to people without fully even understanding what's happening with them. Clearly, he saw that this young boy was distressed. He was crying. He was in distress. But he didn't immediately go to him and try to sort it out. He talked to the people around him. And once he sorted out what was happening, then he thought to himself, this is what I need to do next. And look at this beautiful story and how it plays out. He then approaches the young boy, Abba Umair, and he said his very famous statement that we now have in the hadith of how it is we know this story because it's part of the hadith literature. And he said to him, Ya Abba Umair, O oh, Abba Umair, ma fa'alan nughayr. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. I mean, just even the eloquence of the Prophet وسلم, that he literally rhymed the name Abba Umayr to the story at hand. So here's what the story was. The story was the Prophet وسلم, learned from the family members that little, the little boy Abba Umayr was crying and tearful and sad and distressed because his pet bird had passed away, had died. My children recently had a pet who passed away, or a 
quarantine, you know, our COVID uh, pandemic uh, pet that we had, subhanAllah, and just the other week, they were so distressed over the the death of their pet. And I thought to myself, subhanAllah, this is so similar to this story. And, 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 and the kind of angst and emotion in their world, in their world, this is a big deal. Whereas in our adult world, maybe it wouldn't be as big of a deal, although certainly there are adults that are very, very close to some of their pets, right? Um, but here is Abba Umayr really in distress. And the Prophet وسلم, goes to him and he says to him, Ya Abba Umayr, ma fa'ala nughayr. And nughayr is, the translation of this word is, a small bird. It's a play on the word bird. And it rhymes. He could have used many other words for bird, but he uses this one to rhyme his name. Just the eloquence upon all the Prophet وسلم. And, and it was just a short phrase. That's it. It's a, it's a short sentence. There's not this long hadith that follows. And we think about, subhanAllah, this too is from emotional intelligence. When a person is in a state of distress, in that moment, in that acute moment, they don't need a lecture. They're not ready to hear a lecture. They're in a moment of distress. So as light as you can tread, the better. And we don't see a whole hadith that follows this. It actually was a playful, jestful way of the Prophet ﷺ talking to this young, very distressed boy. And understanding at the boy's level, coming down to his level, and understanding that in his world, this is a big deal. So he also doesn't brush it off like some of us do with our own family and friends. And even to ourselves, we do this. We brush off distress. And sometimes we say things like, well, at least I don't have a bomb falling on my head. May Allah protect all of us, including our sisters and brothers that in fact do have bombs falling on their heads. But that's not your reality if you're not in a war-torn situation. And maybe your reality is comparatively smaller, but in your world, it's a big deal. The Prophet ﷺ would go to people at their level and meet them at their level. And this was part of his emotional intelligence, sallallahu alayhi wa and then look at the way in which he asked the question. It wasn't just that it was playful. It was also very purposeful because there's nothing that the Prophet ﷺ says except that it is said with accuracy and that it is said with purposefulness. And so he asks him, not what did you do, accusatory, what did you do to the bird? He asks him, what did the bird do? Ma fa'ala nughayr. <laughs> in a playful way, right? As in to say, what did that bird do, right? And in that way, he, he was able to get Abba Umaid to, you know, to kind of not feel that level of stress, to kind of bring it down, right? And be able to engage with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and understand that he was there to comfort him. There was no accusatory peace. Sometimes we do this to our friends and to our loved ones, our family members. We kind of, they're going through a tough time and we say, well, you know, you brought that upon yourself or things of this nature, right? But that's not from emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence of the Prophet وسلم, from his sunnah is to meet people where they are, to understand their level of stress at their moment of distress. Empathy. Empathy is putting yourself in the shoes of someone else in order to feel, huh, what would it be like, huh, what they're feeling. You know, Ibn Hajar has said about this hadith that there are at least 60, 60 rulings of sharia derived from this one little hadith. That is how weighty <laughs> this hadith is. It's phenomenal. There are so many lessons to be derived here. And I start with it because whenever we think about the Prophet ﷺ and the kind of guidance that he was able to bring us and the kind of emotional intelligence he was teaching us, and then people ask questions like, how do I deal with stress? My first answer is always, look at the best of all of examples. Look at the best of all of humanity. 
and you will find your answers there. We can come up, of course, with all kinds of other discussions, which we will talk about today here, inshallah. We'll talk some biology, we'll talk some genetics, we'll also talk some techniques, right? We'll talk about therapy, all kinds of things will come up today, inshallah. But first, we must start with the best of all examples, the example of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when I think about this, I think about how we uh, often do this thing where we do launch into that large, you know, <laughs> uh, you know uh, lecture about what people should do or shouldn't do or how they should feel or shouldn't feel. We'll say things like, you know, to people, you know, get over it. There's more uh, fish in the sea, more birds in the sky, I suppose, mashallah, right? Because it was a pet bird. Um, or we'll say things like, have patience. Now, there's nothing wrong with reminding people of sabr and patience. But you also have to balance it because in that very acute moment, can they, are they even hearing you out or not? And then up to yourself, because if you're kind of giving your own self-advice, sometimes we get really hard on ourselves, really hard on our harsh, harsh ways of dealing even with ourselves. And we don't allow ourselves to have the room to even grieve or to acknowledge that what just happened here is a big thing, right? I meet people all the time and in counseling all the time, I find people who are, who really um, guilt trip themselves for even having emotions like stress. And I say, why? It is a natural human emotion. It is a natural response that God has created our bodies to have when things are not going right. It's literally an alert system for you. And I'll talk about this in a moment to show a little bit more. But just think about this. Things, think about the emotional intelligence of the Prophet ﷺ. And always ask yourself, what would the Prophet do? <laughs> what would the Prophet say? How would he react? And how did he react? Because we already have those examples. We just need to learn them more. SubhanAllah. And so this is the sin of the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if we really want to follow the prophetic example, we also have to be holistic in the way we deal with each other, with the world around us, and with ourselves, right? MashaAllah. And so I'm very happy to be having this conversation because I think it's very um, a very useful uh, conversation, MashaAllah. Now, I'm going to tell you, but I'm shift now from the time of the Prophet ﷺ and shift just, just a few more hundred years a little later um, to the ninth century, where, we, where I'm going to talk about a, a Muslim scholar who contributed immensely to the field of what today we call psychology. And you may know that this is someone I talk about quite often because I find that his work is quite phenomenal, mashallah, and that I've published and written about him extensively as well because I think his works are so excellent. And his name is Abu Zayd al-Balkhi. Abu Zayd al-Balkhi is in the ninth century. And he wrote a very beautiful book, small, but very weighty book. And it's called Masalih al-Abdan wal-Anfus. Uh, translated, the only half of the book is translated now, um, uh, the part that's called Sustenance of the Soul. But it, the title would be translated as Sustenance of the Body and Soul. It's a two-part book where he writes the first half on body-based or physical medical conditions. And in the second half of the book, he writes about um, essentially mental health conditions. Ninth century, mind you, mashallah. And a lot of the papers that I've written about him that have you know, sparked actually a lot of the work we do at the lab, the Stanford Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab, uh, was initially sparked by my work on Belkhi. And then Mashallah, so many other studies and, and, and research lines have followed since that period of time. But some of the papers that I published on Belkhi was showing how what, what, um, what the, in fact, the translator of the book, uh, his book, Dr. Malik Badri, Ali, who just passed away earlier this year, please make du'a for him, uh, our mentor and predecessor in the field, and he would call Al-Balkhi from the ninth century, he would call him uh, somebody who was a, had precocious genius. <laughs> yeah, and a genius of way ahead of his time. And it's so true. And I bring your attention on the topic of stress today uh, to Al-Balkhi because in his book, in the ninth century, mind you, he's talking about how to deal with distress. How do you deal with being stressed out? So, so I'm going kind of chronologically here and showing you from the Islamic tradition what's been so phenomenal about our tradition. It is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. It is our Quran and hadith that sparks so much of what the scientists and physicians and other forms of scholars contributed to this understanding of the human self. 
علم النفس. Essentially, today we call this psychology. And Al-Balkhi was one of these main people who contributed in his amazing book. And his book, and you should listen to the title, Sustenance of the Body and Soul, and Mind Body Medicine. Right? And you think about this term, mind body medicine, it sounds like something new age. It's not new age. It's been part of our tradition forever. It's been part of our Islamic legacy forever. And in Al Balkhi's case, a lot of what he was writing, what I was publishing on about him, he found he was writing in the ninth century things that weren't discovered until the 19th century, not just some hundred years of a difference, a millennium of a difference. I have papers about him and OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, and Belchi and phobias, for example, and some other writings. And in these papers, we have proven, alhamdulillah, that things like OCD weren't discovered by some you know, European scholar and the psychologist in the 19th century. It was al Belchi in the 9th century. And the historians of medicine have had to correct and inshallah, a process of rewriting history that has excluded the Muslims out of it, either purposefully or inadvertently. But it's not until we as Muslims start really taking our own history that's inspired by the Sunnah initially, seriously, and writing about ourselves for ourselves and for others to learn, as opposed to allowing others to write about us and literally write us out of history, right? SubhanAllah. I digressed a little bit, but I'm very excited about al Madhi, inshallah, and to show you a little bit about um, some of his work. And it's important to see, because it's when you, when you hear what he has to say about this, you really will be kind of amazed, inshallah. When he writes about stress, he says that the human soul can either be healthy or unhealthy, just like the body can be healthy or unhealthy. We know that. We know when a person gets sick health-wise, they're, they're phys- it could be physically unhealthy, but you can also be emotionally and spiritually unhealthy. And he says, just like you go and get attention, medical attention for any bodily health issues, we must have the same process if a person is having any emotional or mental health issues. Ninth century. So when people start saying this, this, this uh, psychology stuff isn't for Muslims, I say we were the people who were at the forefront of the field who created the whole conversation in the first place, subhanAllah, right? If we were to just know our traditions. And so he was, the Balkhi says, so if a person has, it becomes unhealthy mental health wise, then we have to return ourselves back to health. It is part of our God given uh, rights upon us, that our body has a right upon us ourselves and our families and our Lord has a right upon us, right? So you begin the whole process of well-being by making sure that we A, maintain that health, and if it goes out of health, we bring it back to health, right? And then he gives examples. He says the body, just like the body, and this every time he tries to explain something mental health, he, he gives you an example of the body. He says, okay, maybe people are, it's easier for them to understand how the body reacts. So let's give you an example of that first, then I'll explain the mental health, right? He says, look, when the body um, has, uh, gets cold, for example, has an external hazard, right? Let's say like cold, they get cold, right? Extreme cold or extreme heat. You all know, we all know and understand it's an imbalance. There is a an imbalance. And that's an example of an external imbalance, heat or cold. But there is also internal imbalance that can happen. So we all know, right? Like if a person um, doesn't take care of what they're eating, their diet, internally, there can be an internal imbalance of health, right? And so he says, either internal or external, you have to take care of it. You have to take good care of it. And then he says, similarly, it is just like that and the soul right? Your emotional and mental and spiritual well-being, it's exactly the same. It has both internal and external factors, just like the body. And he gives examples and he says, externally protecting your soul, literally from the elements, right? It's like when you are experiencing this stress. So here comes the conversation on stress. He says that this distress, right, can either come from an arousal of emotions like anger or sadness or fear, right? 
and it could be caused externally. You hear bad news, you see something terrible on the news, right? Or it can come internally, internally because you're constantly have negative thinking. You keep on going over and over and over in your own head. Nobody else can see it or hear it. It's happening inside of yourself, right? Negative cycle of thinking over and over and over. So Balkhi says, and exactly like this, just like there could be internal and external methods, then there also can be internal and external treatments in order to reach a more peaceful and tranquil state. How do you do this? That's the question. How do you do this? So he gives us really example, uh, really an interesting example and wonderful formula where he says it actually takes uh, the importance of self-talk and talk with those who are trained to talk to you. Like uh, Dr. Balik Badri in his translation of Balkhi's work, he calls uh, Balkhi probably the first cognitive behavioral therapist. <laughs> because Al Balkhi literally champions talk therapy. And he goes through his whole book talking about different forms of therapy, talk therapy. I know I meet so many Muslims who just say, oh, no, no, no. that's such a Western thing. Only, only non-Muslims or Western people, you know, go to, go to somebody's office and talk to a shrink or talk to a therapist and tell them, that, tell some stranger their problem. That's not a Muslim thing to do. Yes, subhanAllah. Yes, subhanAllah, do we know our tradition? Here is al balkhi in the ninth century explaining and literally outlining what talk therapy would be like. And he literally says, if you are experiencing this cycle of negative thinking, then A, number one, you start to form positive ways of self-talk. And if you can't do it on your own, then you need to go to those who can help you figure out positive self-talk which is the role of a professional, the role of a therapist, somebody who's trained, who Balkhi calls a person who you trust and is trustworthy and knows how to do this work. They're ahl al They are the people of knowledge on this particular topic. It's amazing. It's amazing, subhanAllah, right? And so he says, you know, we have to protect our, our soul, our self from the internal and external negative thinking that harms us. And stress can definitely do that for us. And part of the healing is in one of two ways. That when, number one, that when we start, to, when we have a good day, when we have a good day, we're in a good moment, a non-stressful moment, right? You're feeling peaceful and tranquil. You're doing all right. This is where he says you need to be able to take, to, to seize the moment, literally seize the moment, okay? And put this good moment and this good day give gratitude, give shukr. By the way, that you know, uh, Western psychology has co-opted so many of these things, this concept of gratitude, there's gratitude journals. You know, you go to therapists, they tell you to write about and talk about your gratitude. And I'm thinking to myself, this is shukr. This is exactly from our tradition, right? al Balkhi is talking about this in the ninth century. Give shukr when the day is good. Like the hadith that talks about, where's he getting it from? It comes directly from the hadith. Remember me in times of ease. Right? I remember you in times of hardship. Seize the moment. Belchi talks about taking these happy and tranquil moments and putting them into a treasure box. Like literally a, 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 a treasure trove that later in the rainy day, when it's difficult and it's stressful, you pull it out and it helps you. SubhanAllah. <laughs> These are all techniques that we practice as professional mental health professionals in the modern uh, sense. But it's been talked about by our scholars and traditions of old. These are not new or modern phenomena. They're certainly not Western phenomena, subhanAllah, right? And so Valkhi is talking about in when it's a peaceful and good moment. And when it's not, this is where he talks about, number one, taking on that monologue of self-convincing. You have to do some self-talk, right? Before you do the professional, have somebody help you. What is the self-talk he's referring to? He talks about when you come to a realization that the inherent nature of this world, this dunya, is a world of tribulation. 
It's a world of difficulties, of tests and trials. Then at that point, you don't put expectations onto it that are unrealistic. I have this conversation all the time with my, with my client there and my patients, Muslim or not, all the time we're having conversations of, is that a realistic expectation or not? Because some of the stress that's coming up, some of your carrying the stress is because you have unrealistic expectations of either the people in your life, the situations in your life, right? The, 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 the world itself and how it functions, subhanAllah. And so here, you know, we, we really have to remind ourselves that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already explained this to us in the Quran, right? In Surah Al-Ankabut, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَحَسِبَ النَّاسُ أَنْ يُتْرَكُوا أَنْ يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ Do people really think that they're going to be left alone? And he left alone as in to say, not tested. Because they merely say, we believe, آمَنَّا And that they're not going to be tested. وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ Right? It's a rhetorical question. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, you will be tested in this world. It is the darul bala, as the scholars have called it. It is the, the abode of trials and tribulations. It is. Don't expect it to be anything other than that. Right? Because we as Muslims, as believers, we have the akhirah, the hereafter. And we understand that all ease and full tranquility only comes in the akhir. So you already have a frame, you know, that isn't, um, that's, that's pragmatic, it's realistic. You don't have a very rosy, tinted glasses on in this dunya, and you also don't look at it as totally bleak and terrible, right? <laughs> right? You have kind of a very balanced middle way, especially our prophetic middle way, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, that, that he, he literally answers the rhetorical question that is asked in Surah Al-Ankabut about do people think they're going to be left alone only because they say we believe and they won't be tested. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains more clearly to us, right? He says, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْسٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنْفُسِ وَالْثَمَرَاتِ And certainly we shall test you with something of fear, hunger, loss of wealth, lives, fruits. It's going to happen. And if this pandemic has taught us anything, it has taught us exactly all of those things wrapped up in one, subhanAllah. How many loss of lives have we seen in this pandemic and sickness of ourselves or our family members and people close to us, loss of jobs and finances, people in distress, either marital distress or with isolated at home with their children or figuring out how to transition between hybrid models of learning and working. It's really hard. It is hard. And if you go about thinking that you're, one time I heard a spiritual, one of my spiritual teachers, somebody, one of her students was saying how, you know, something really difficult had happened to her. And uh, she was saying it in a way that was somewhat complaining. Like you can state facts, such and such and such difficult thing has happened. But there's a way in which we sometimes speak that is complaining. Why does this have to happen to me? How come it happens to you? Why me? Right? Which is not okay. And so she just looked at her and said, why do you think your tribulations are worse than other people's? And as in to say, all people will be tribulated. And if you go about this world thinking otherwise, you will always be in a state of distress. So Al-Balkhi, back to Al-Balkhi, he's basically telling us, be pragmatic, right? When things are going well, pause. Remind yourself that this world is not meant to be an easy place and hold on to the happy thoughts, right? Carpe diem, take, seize that moment, subhanAllah. Put it in that treasure trove for a rainy day, pull it out when you need it. To remind yourself, actually, no, sometimes it's good. Sometimes things are going well, alhamdulillah, right? But also be pragmatic to remind yourself that trials are right around the corner. Not that the world is, you know, just bleak, but rather that there will be trials and the trials could be right around the corner. al balkhi is incredibly astute, really. I really think it's incredibly astute because what he's doing is essentially giving us techniques to protect ourselves from stress. To teach us how to be more resilient. 
and how when the time comes and we need to draw upon that inner strength, we know how to draw upon it. And when we need help externally from ourselves, that it's not a shameful thing to do. Because in the Quran, and yes, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and ask the people of knowledge if you do not know. If you've hit a roadblock, seek out a person of knowledge. And in this instance, that person of knowledge is a trained counselor. Right? SubhanAllah. Right? To really think about that. And someone's going to walk away from the lecture saying, Dr. Rania said in the Quran, go to therapy. <laughs> it did not say in the Quran, it says to go to therapy. What it does say in the Quran is seek out the people of knowledge if you do not know. And who are the people of knowledge who know how to help you with cognitive and behavioral techniques to help you through moments of intense stress like this or other forms of difficulty? They are, in fact, the trained professional therapists. And better yet, if they are, of course, from your own faith tradition so that they can help with the parts of this that are spiritual in nature. Now, let's go back to Al-Balkhi and some of his stress reduction techniques, right? He says, for example, that as, a, you know, this is something, subhanAllah, even a modern CBT cognitive behavioral therapist will advise you, uh, subhanAllah, right? But it's right in Al-Balkhi's work. He actually says, he advises us to be fully relaxed and tranquil and remind ourselves that the worldly troubles are only natural and to be expected. And whenever it feels like it's too easy, then it's too good to be true. Right? And that he's deriving this from the ayah that's telling us that I mentioned earlier, that tests and tribulations are part of this dunya. And don't fool yourself into thinking otherwise, because the believers will be tested. All people will be tested. But the people who will be tested the most are the people closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And who is the, who are the most closest people? They are the prophets. And if you look at the stories of the prophets that are all throughout the Quran, it is one test after tribulation after another test after another tribulation to no end. It's a lot of Allah. Really, you want to talk about stress and grief and sadness and, and loss. These are the stories of the prophets, every single one of them. SubhanAllah. Now, Al-Balkhi also, in his book, very astutely talks about something that's very um, interesting to me. He's, he, it's essentially what today we would even call like a modern technique, something in, in, in today's terms we call reciprocal inhibition. Reciprocal inhibition is basically where you take something that's a, like a, a difficult, like a, a noxious stimulus, really is how you say it scientifically. What it is, is kind of like a very difficult emotion, okay? Like stress. Let's use stress as the example. And you repeatedly connect it with a relaxing response until you create a bond between these two things, the painful, stressful stimulus and the relaxing stimulus. And you keep pairing them, pairing them, pairing them together until finally something called systemic desensitization happens. Yeah, and you desensitize yourself from that stress. And you see people like this. The people, subhanAllah, that are connected to God, that know Allah, the arifin billah, that when something very heavy or difficult happens, and we're taught this, and all of us know this, I'm just going to remind us, we all know this, that when you hear terrible news, not just the passing, or you know, somebody passes away, but any terrible news, the immediate response that should come with it is, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. From Allah we've come, and to Allah we shall return. Always reminding us, this isn't this dunya and all the stuff and it isn't actually ours it belongs to allah and when he wants it he will call it back he'll call it back right subhanallah and so when you when you, and so the people close to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you'll see as soon as they hear the difficult news it's immediately like la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah no might there is no might except for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no might or ability except for the loss of subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have bonded, they have literally bonded these things together. And so there is a sense of relaxation because you realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually the one who is in charge. 
He is actually a boss with a capital B. <laughs> Subhanallah. Right? So Al Balkhi very masterfully is explaining these techniques to us in the ninth century, mind you, mashallah, right? And he's trying to explain to us that if you consistently remind yourself that when you're feeling positive and you're in a positive mind space, that life is tough and it's not easy, that later on, when you do come up with struggles and distress, that you don't have this heightened level of anxiety, heightened level of stress, because you have already trained yourself to expect that struggles are part of a normal life. Like, the, like my teacher said, you know, why do you think your difficulties are worse than other people's? <laughs> Subhanallah. And so al balkhi very masterfully uses kind of a psycho-spiritual, religious, cognitive approach to remind us that this world is truly a place of expected distress. And it is the hereafter where we will really experience full happiness. And this application that I'm referring to, right, is part of you know, acceptance. It's part of heartfulness. People you like to say mindfulness. We like to say heartfulness. It's much more in line with Islamic traditions, mashallah. And he's saying all of this in early Islamic understandings derived from the understandings of the hadith and the Quran. And this is not it. This is not the only thing. And Balkhi also teaches us another wonderful technique that he tells us about, you know, the basic tenets of social interactions with the different you know, people, is that we should know that there are going to be anxiety or stressful provoking elements in these experiences, meaning that when you deal with people, whether they be your family members, your spouse, your children, and people in the community, there are going to be times that whenever you interact with another person, there is bound to be stress. That too is part of normal life. And so in counseling, I find people say all the time, you know, my in-laws are the most stress-provoking. And I think to myself, you know, most people would say the same thing. Again, why, why, why is your situation different than others, right? You know, when I have to deal with my kids, they drive me up the wall. And it's like, yeah, that's part of, part and parcel of parenting. And so part of this is to normalize the conversation, to say to ourselves, stress is something that is part and parcel of this life. And it helps because then when you start to realize that there is, it's yes, it's your stress and it's your, you know, life, your difficulty that's happening within it, but it's also not so abnormal. All the time, I, you know, people, I, I'll say, yeah, and that's pretty normal in parenting. I'm like, really? Really? Yeah, so kind of And it helps. It helps people to understand that they're not the only person going through what they're going through, right? So Belchi tells us back to what he's saying. He says, you know, Train ourselves, train ourselves to not overreact to minor incidents. Train ourselves to tolerate irritating ex experiences, right? Until it becomes a little more habitual that these minor inconveniences, right? Are not going to have us completely wig out. <laughs> you meet people who like, it's relatively small, but they have like lost it. They've gone from zero to, you know, <laughs> and uh, so he's basically saying train yourself it comes with the discipline that islam teaches us to tolerate some of these more painful uh effects just like and again he always gives examples to the body he says look look like like when, when it gets really hot or it gets really cold what do you do it gets really cold you put on a jacket it gets really hot you take the jacket off Right? You know what to do for your body when you're hot or cold. Why is it that we don't know what to do with our emotions when we feel this way? Right? Just the same way you would train the body, you would train your soul. You train your emotions. You train your cognition. It's a preemptive technique. And it requires thinking ahead of time. Planning ahead of time. It requires having this res a reservoir, a reserve, a reserve that he's referring to of good and healthy and positive thoughts and good and healthy techniques. So they're preemptive in nature. And then he, he qualifies, he qualifies everything he's saying. And he says a person who's going to use such techniques, right? When they experience problems or difficulty, they should be aware of the degree of forbearance that their soul can bear or not bear. It's very important. 
Wallahi, this point is so key. Because everything I said stands, but it, how it applies to each and every one of us here differs. Because each one of us is different. And how much each one of us can bear is different. SubhanAllah, if you're somebody who grew up and had traumatic incidents in your lifetime and in your childhood or came from a war-torn country with lots of trauma that you have witnessed and seen, maybe small things add up for you and just pile up on top of already still open wounds that haven't been healed versus someone who hasn't experienced all that and maybe can tolerate more. So you need to know yourself the degree of forbearance that your soul can bear. And that's how we figure out different people's level of endurance. And this is why working one-on-one -on -one with somebody who is trained and professional is very helpful because they know how to modulate this based on your level of endurance. It's not just general advice such as we we're talking about here. It would be much more custom tailored to your experience and your history and your background. So the solution is really for the person to know themselves and to work with someone who gets to know you. <laughs> and help you, right, right, person of knowledge to do so. And that brings us to the conversation of knowing our souls and knowing to the degree to which we can tolerate stress and protecting ourselves from the things that trigger those stress. You know, for example, that every time you go to a social gathering and you sit with people who just talk on and on and on about the newest thing that they bought and the newest place that they went and the coolest thing that they did triggers you, then avoid such situations to the best of your ability or show face for a bit and then get out of there. But people do this thing where they stay in social settings that they know aren't healthy for them. They know they're triggered by it. And out of a sense of obligation, they're there for these extended periods of time. Whereas the obligation could have been fulfilled in a shorter period of time and out, but it takes some discipline. It takes some knowing of the self, right? Of knowing how to in and out <laughs> if you need to, subhanAllah, right? This is what the modern therapist would call boundary setting. And some people don't like this term because they think, oh, what is this term? It sounds to Western. And Allah, you know, this is part of our tradition too. Because in Islam, we learn that you should never put yourself in a demeaning situation or befriend or put yourself, even people who are blood ties to you, who will demean you or have you uh, do something that goes against or contradicts Islam. So subhanAllah, going back here now, we're talking about kind of Belkhi's um, solutions for knowing ourselves, right? It comes with knowing the nature of our soul and know, it comes with knowing the degree to which we can tolerate stress. It comes with deciding based on our knowledge and maybe with the help of a professional if needed, what kind of problems we're ready to face and what kind of problems we need to avoid at all cost, right? This kind of um, knowledge really helps us you know, and it helps everybody. It doesn't matter what level of education you have, what level, where you are, social, economically, in society, everybody needs this, right? SubhanAllah. And so we recognize when we reach out for help, when help is needed. And if there's anything that I can say in kind of closing this conversation today and really helping us think this through is knowing where and when to get help and support. Because subhanAllah, we have reached a point in our ummah and our society, particularly those who are in the US, but really even globally. I was talking to uh, international students, mashallah, from across the world globally, who are all going into this profession to help their fellow you know, Muslims kind of talk and become professionals who are able to do professional talk therapy, hopefully integrated with the Islamic approach, right? We have many more resources than we ever used to. You know, my, my own uh, organization that's connected with, with my lab, um, Madistan. Madistan, the name, by the way, people always ask, what is Madistan? And uh, Madistan is the English uh, word, which is shortened from the original Persian of Bimadistan. The Bimadistan, the Bimad is the ill person. And Stan, as you know, is the place of. So it's the place where the ill person, the sick person would go to get help. It was a hospital, a healing center is even better translation than a hospital. In Arabic, it was called the Dada Shifa. Again, same translation, the place or home of healing, center of healing. And uh, the Madistans, 
is something that was such a beautiful heritage in Islamic history. It is the trademark of everywhere and anywhere Islam went, the Maristans followed. Maristans sprung up every which way. And they were healing centers that were holistic, mind, body, soul. And that is why Muslims were the very first to our knowledge in Islam and in history, in the history of humanity, to have psychiatric wards, mental health wards, sections of the hospital, the healing center dedicated to mental health. They didn't have an issue because mind, body, soul, it was all connected. You broke your leg, you need to go get it set. You go to this section of the Maristan, right? You're having a, a, you know, a, a heart attack, you go to this section of the Maristan. You're having a mental health condition, you go to this section of the Maristan. Holistic healing, it was all there. And the modalities they used were talk therapy. Yes, talk therapies. Yes, they had many, many talk therapies, types of talk therapy in the Maristans. They had forms of art therapy and forms of sound therapy and forms of aromatherapy. They had medications, yes, medications. Medical medication concomitants that they would make in the pharmacies that were part of the Madistan. It was phenomenal. And then they had, of course, their religious or spiritual healing. They had teams of people that were doing all of these things, mind, body, soul. This is our tradition, the tradition we have lost and we have attempted to replace by the colonial powers and their kind of, you know, backwards ways of dealing with things and kind of isolating it in just, you know, biological ways of thinking, as is the modern way of thinking today, right? My lab is within a school of medicine because psychology and psychiatry by and large has become a medicalized field. But that is not how it was understood by the Muslims. It was understood as holistic. It was interdisciplinary. So many disciplines contributed to the field called the ilm nafs that today we roughly translate into psychology. And this kind of very interdisciplinary way of thinking had in it the theologians, had the people who were the muhaddithin, the people of kalam, the people of fiqh, the people of medicine, the people of philosophy, all of them contributed to what became ilm nafs and therefore their theories, their ways of treatment, their modalities, and their institutions like the Madistans were holistic and interdisciplinary in their healing methods. So it is no surprise, and this is what I'm gonna end with, that when you look at someone like Belchi, and in his section where he talks about stress, which we've been covering today, and then you look at his steps, it is no surprise that he has three steps in the mental health disorders. He says, certain of these conditions need medication. Literally, he says, <laughs> take the medication. And he himself actually writes out recipes of, you know, certain, you know, kind of, um, you know, pre-modern recipes of medications for different things, you know, for when you have depression, you know, when you have anxiety, when you have <laughs> soprano, right? And then he says, number two, talk to the trustworthy person who can help you the person of knowledge, like it says in the Quran. Essentially today we call this person a professional, like a therapist. And then number three, he says, and better your spiritual state. Work on your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing how and when to rely on him after you've tied your own camel. Gani, how more holistic of a prescription do you want than that? And I remind you, this is in the ninth century. Our tradition, subhanAllah, is amazing and excellent. What we need to do is really revive it, to understand it. This has been so much of my work in these many, many years now, subhanAllah, of going back to our turaf, our original primary text, and pulling out the gems from them, subhanAllah. Because I'm not so convinced that the modern mental health system is going to be enough for the people of faith. I do believe wholly that it's going to have to bring back what psychology lost. See, psychology lost its soul. But for the Muslims, their ilm al nafs, which is literally knowledge of the self and soul, has never been lost. We could actually help the modern field by reminding them to bring the soul back. This whole concept of bring your whole self into therapy. Yeah, well, your whole self for a person of faith includes their soul 
and includes their spirit and includes their faith. <laughs> Subhanallah. So we need to do this. We need to be people who are at the very forefront of this. And just in closing, you know, I've shared with you a number of the number, but I want to kind of remind us and help us kind of comfort us to remind us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to us um, in the Quran, right? In Surah Al-Baqarah, he said, La nafsan illa wusaha, that Allah is not going to burden a soul more than it can bear. And it's really important because sometimes you need to take a step back and look at the whole picture because you're feeling this distress. You're feeling really stressed out by what's happening with you. Always remember to take a step back, reflect, take in the whole picture and realize that when you're stressed out, like we said at the very beginning of the talk, that this is actually a natural human reaction. This is something Allah has created in us. You know, in the Mayo Clinic, they did some really wonderful research and they showed how stress is a normal physiological reaction to the ever increasing demands of life that the brain has in it an alarm system. We're hardwired that if things become too distressful, what happens? Our, our brain is literally hardwired to sound the alarm, sound the alarm. That's what stress is. It's sounding the alarm. So when your brain kind of perceives a threat, okay, it signals your body to release a burst of hormones that fuels your capacity to respond. This is what we call the flight, the fight or flight response. Because it tells you danger, right? Run. Or it tells you danger, fight. And if you do not have this normal reaction inside of you, you would always be in harm's way. And when the threat is gone, then the body goes back to normal, the hormones go back to normal, right? And you are able to deal with the rest of the rest of your day and the rest of your life the problem in the modern lifestyle though unfortunately is that this alarm rarely shuts off because we are constantly under a state of stress we are constantly plugged into the news or we're doing doom scrolling all throughout on our feeds and it's always lots and lots of bad news or we do escapism and just watch all the funny stuff but it just that's not dealing with the problems either and because we juggle with so many multiple responsibilities, work and home life and caregiving and relationships and all kinds of things that we have to do, it is really important to have very good stress reduction techniques like the ones we've been talking about all day today, right? And to make it an ongoing goal of our, of our, uh, our life. And so you take a step back, remind yourself, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسحفة, that Allah is not going to burden us more than it can, we can bear. And so if he brought us a stressful situation in our life, the first question you ask yourself is, Ya Allah, what is the wisdom behind this? What is it that you're trying to teach me or show me? What am I meant to learn from this? And you remind yourself that whatever trial comes your way, it's something Allah has already planned for you. He already had, and, he had, and because of that, he already guaranteed you can handle it. That's why it's come to you and not to someone else. He guaranteed you can handle it because it's in the Quran and it says so, that he's not going to burden you with something more than you can bear. And I know that's really heavy and hard to because people have, well, I lost, I have this, you know, this person, my loved one is lost, or now I'm widowed, or I have a special needs child, or I have, yeah, subhanAllah. And for whatever reason, Allah has determined in his divine wisdom, you can handle that. You know why it's comforting these verses as hard as they are? They're comforting because the faithful mu'min, the faithful believer, is the one who understands that Allah, in his wisdom, deep down in their heart, knows that they can never really truly be overwhelmed because Allah has given them the means. And sometimes that means it's going to be outside of themselves. It's going to be that professional care. Right? That Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you take a step back, and you take a step back and you remind yourself what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, where he says, right? Allah has not going to let anything happen to us, right? Except that it's already been written for us. And we remind ourselves like the hadith of the Prophet that these, I, these things in our life, it's already been written. And the pens have been lifted and the pages have dried. 
And so it doesn't matter if you think or perceive people are trying to harm you. They can't actually harm you except by the will of Allah. Maybe he has sent this harm to you as a wake-up call, as a reminder, as a lesson, as something that, as a, a way to like help expiate your sins, to get you closer and better, to make you stronger, right? All these are possibilities, but they can't actually harm you unless he wills for it. And like the rest of the hadith says, and if all the people of the word gather to help you, they cannot help you except with Allah, with what Allah has willed. The, pages, the, the pens have been lifted and the pages have dried. So we try, we try, we really try to understand this. And it's hard sometimes to understand, but you have to remind yourself, subhanAllah, then this is what I'll end with, kind of the three main things, the kind of a, you know, somewhat of a reminder, almost like a over and over, you tell yourself this, right? You say to yourself, Ya Allah, these times are tough, but you made me tougher. Ya Allah, Whatever you've set my way, inshallah, you have the ability to make it go away. And ya Allah, if you brought me to it, inshallah, you can bring me through it. You will bring me through it. And ya Allah, that when I face you, inshallah, when we are, you know, when no, when in that moment, subhanAllah, in the akhirah, when I'm standing for my hisab, for my judgment, and no one is with me, no spouse, no father, no mother, no child, no friend, no sibling, nothing, nobody, that you are pleased with me, and I, inshallah, am pleased with your faith, ya Allah, that you have given me. And so when we go to these difficult situations, say this, say this, the times might be tough, but I am tougher. Whatever comes my way will go away. And if Allah brought me to it, he will bring me through it. Allahumma amin. Ya Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us, allow us, inshallah, to understand the wisdom of the stress that he has given us in our lives. Lessons learned. Remember the hadith that says that even the prick of a thorn, we receive expiation of, thin, of sins. That even a prick of a thorn, let alone a massive, you know, a stressful thing that's happened to you. Allah expiates our sins. He forgives us and he blesses us even for a small inconvenience, let alone a big one. Remember Allah is there. Remember that he's in charge. Remember that he will see you through and remember that he's given you the means through other people, potentially if you need them, to help you through. So seek out help when you need it. And I pray, inshallah, this has been a useful um, conversation. And I'll wrap up here reminding us very similar to where we started with Abba Umayr, the story of the young Sahabi who, um, who, uh, who the Prophet وسلم, consoled at the death of his pet bird. And he was feeling distressed and overwhelmed and upset. And so if you are feeling distressed and overwhelmed and upset by things that are happening to you, you are Abba Umayr. You are Abba Umayr, but no that help is around the corner. Humble, let's humble ourselves to seek it out when we need the help. And I encourage you, inshallah, to please um, keep in touch with us at Madistan. Check out the resources that are there and please support it, the work, the campaigns, and of course, inshallah, the work that comes out of our lab, uh, the Stanford Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab. My aim and you know, inshallah, sincere intention is to be able to pull out from our turaf revive our heritage of Islamic understandings of the self and techniques that are in line with the Quran and the Sunnah and modern, of course, scientifically backed techniques of healing. And we pray, inshallah, that all of this coalesces into something that is helpful and useful. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive you and me and accept from all of us, inshallah, the good and protect us and heal us and our families. اللهم آمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. Take good care. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. This is your sister, Dr. Rania Awad, signing off.